Hi everyone, uh, welcome back to the Philosophy Podcast. Um, but today I'd like to cover a subject that um, a lot of people have asked me about. It's something I've studied quite a lot and um, I think it's uh, worth covering out of interest and I think a lot of people are interested in it now and I think it's going to become more significant over the longer run and more and more people may be interested to find out about it and that is Bitcoin and uh, what I'd like to start off with talking about is why should we care about Bitcoin at all why should we care about this complicated technological computer geeky financial weird stuff called Bitcoin and I think the main reason I personally am interested in it is because it offers an alternative to the sort of money we've had in this world for the last 10,000 years this is a really a new form of money um, in, in many ways and the, the money that we've had up to now is what's called fiat currency fiat currency and basically that is where government or a ruler, king, emperor, pharaoh issues a token which the pharaoh or emperor says I will guarantee the value of that token so in the past for a long time they used to guarantee the value of the token i.e. the money, the coin originally or the note more recently the ruler would say, I guarantee the value of that current that, that token to something of real value. So it used to be normally gold or silver. So there would be a certain amount of gold or silver, and if you took that token to the ruler or the emperor or the government and said, Look, I want I don't want this token, I prefer to have the gold in exchange for this token, then you can. <clears throat> and there would be a fixed amount and you'd get that back. And very few people of course ever do that. Because once it's been established that this token is worth the same as this much gold, then you can just use the token and people just exchange the token which is a lot easier to carry and uh, you know use than a block of gold and they just exchange that instead of the gold and it's great it works really well um, what tends to happen is that the the ruler will start to issue more currency than they actually can guarantee and that's because people forget they don't really very rarely ex try to exchange the token for the the gold so you you know the ruler realizes that only one in a hundred people ever come and exchange a token for the gold so they think well you know if I issued twice as many I can still easily give the gold to the one in a hundred, it's just one percent and I'm just upping, I'm just increasing the amount by fifty percent. So that's a, that's no problem. And I mean the that that logic will go ultimately, anyone who knows about greed and knows about money and knows about their own human heart, that logic will eventually lead you to issuing 99% uh, more than you can cover. 
So you will just have just enough gold to cover the few percent that come to get the to come to exchange the gold for your tokens. And in fact, people in the past have pushed it even beyond that point. And they've just had to say, oh, I'm sorry, we can't we can't give you the gold at the moment, but we will give it to you. And often that leads to a breakdown in currency. Um, so I'm giving you a bit of a background here to what currency is and how it works. It's a token or a voucher for value. And, um, and in fact our present system is one in which there is no gold equivalent for most of the currencies in operation in the world today. And all currencies essentially are traded against the dollar, the US dollar. And, in, and most, most commodities as well, like oil or food or so on, so on, they're traded against the dollar. But the dollar itself is not able to be exchanged by the US government for a particular value of gold or anything else. It actually says on the US dollar, exchangeable for however many US dollar it is, and that's all you can exchange that US dollar for. Um, now, of course, you can buy gold, but there's no guarantee of how much gold you can buy with your dollar. That will depend on what people are willing to give you in exchange for those dollars. And that will depend on how many people are trying to do that. So if a lot of people are trying to exchange their dollars for gold, um, the amount of gold you'll get for a dollar will go down. And it can go, go down dramatically. And it can actually lead to a kind of feedback effect where the value of the dollar will drop in relation to gold. Um, or indeed any any hard asset, any currency, uh, any commodity. And in fact, that's what we've seen over the last sort of 50 years or so. What we've seen is the value of the dollar in relation to a lot of fixed assets go down. And we call this inflation. That's, that's, that's the name of this process. The inflation of prices. But actually it's not an inflation at all. It's actually a decrease in the value. The perceived value of, of, that, of that currency. And... Uh, you know, basically, you, you, you could say that the US dollar in the last sort of 50 years has, has dropped, I think, I mean, something more, more than 90% in value like that. And what you can actually buy with it. And that's basically because it's not. It's not fixed to any particular exchange value. It's not fixed to gold. And the government is always tempted to then print more and more. You know, whenever they get a bill in, they're like, Ooh, how are we going to pay this bill? Well, we could save on this program or this program. Oh, that's not going to be popular. That's really not going to be popular. I know. Why don't we just print some money? And then we'll pay the bill with that. Yeah. Yeah, why not? That sounds good. It's an easy solution. And the people don't notice that really they're paying for that. Because when they print more money, the value of the, the money that people have drops and so in a way it's like you're taking a little tiny bit of everyone's money 
and that's what inflation is. It's a kind of tax, really. And it's the biggest tax, but it's an invisible tax. <laughs> and uh, so it's a very popular tax with politicians. And the only reason they can use this tax is because they can print more money. Now this brings us back to Bitcoin. Now Bitcoin is different than all these currencies that have been around for 10,000 years. It's not linked to gold and it's not linked to anything of real value. So it is a kind of fiat currency. But it's not imposed by any anybody on anyone to use. No government imposes it, obviously. Um, people use it of their own free choice. And it is limited to how many Bitcoins can ever exist. And there is only 21 million Bitcoins can ever exist. And at the moment there's about 13 million. Now, you're probably wondering how new Bitcoins come into existence. And basically, they are given as rewards to people who run the computers that run the Bitcoin system. And uh, this process is called mining. And the reason it's called that is it's designed to mimic the mining of a commodity like gold. So the computers that are running the Bitcoin software um, participate in a competition to find new Bitcoins. And through various complicated mathematical ways, a very specific number of Bitcoins are released per day or per week or whatever and depending on how much mining you're doing you'll tend to get more bitcoins and um, also while you're mining the software is also running the whole bitcoin network now the bitcoin network itself is essentially you can think of it like a, a massive worldwide internet bank account and rather than being run by a bank <laughs> it's run by all these computers that are running that are doing the mining and to participate in mining they have to run the whole Bitcoin network and that means they have to check transactions are legitimate and they have to check uh, and they have to keep a record, a running total of everyone's account. So when I transfer, the, the way the process works is if I transfer uh, some percentage of Bitcoin, maybe one milli Bitcoin, which is one thousandth of a Bitcoin, which at the moment is worth about um, 60 US cents. Yeah. So if I transfer one milli Bitcoin to somebody, maybe for a postage stamp, yeah. So I send one milli Bitcoin to somebody and they send a, a card out for me over the postage network on the internet. So I buy it on, online. I send that. That will cost me about one cent to send that at the most. Yeah. And basically what I'm doing is transferring a part of my Bitcoin account to someone else. And the whole Bitcoin network, all these thousands, hundreds of thousands of computers that are running the Bitcoin network, trying to find new Bitcoins as part of their reward, they also get this one cent and they check that this thousands of a Bitcoin that I send 
I haven't sent to anyone else. That that's on my account right now. It's all timed. It's all time stamped. So they say, right, he's got that in his account and he's trying to send it to this other part of the Bitcoin account. And then they check for a few seconds just to see whether I'm trying to resend it again or whether I'm cancelling the transaction. And if I haven't, then they'll just transfer that from account A to account B within the Bitcoin account with what you can think of as this massive internet account. And this is all done automatically. So this is all done via software program, by rules. And what that means is you don't need to trust anyone. You don't need to trust the government to make sure this transaction goes through. You don't need to trust all the people running the computer programs. You don't even have to trust one of them because they will have to agree among themselves. You know, it's not like one person could say, one of the computers can say, oh, we, we don't recognize this transaction. And then the rest of them will say, okay, fine. We're not recognizing it either. No, there has to be a massive agreement between all these computers. Yes, this transaction is real and it's happened. And boom, and that's finished. And it's as though I've transferred cash. It's as though I've literally given 60 cents in cash. It cannot be undone. See, when you make a, a Bitcoin transaction, you have to be careful. You have to be really sure you're sending it to who you want to and it's the right amount. Because if you don't, there's no comeback. Any more than if you... If you, if you stop someone in their car and gave them £10 and said bye, you don't know their name, you don't know nothing, they're gone. That £10 is gone forever. You know, maybe you could start a worldwide campaign to find someone with that £10, but obviously you're not going to do it. So, so this is how it works. It works like cash, but over the internet. And the whole design of it is designed to be a bit like gold. So, so it's like gold for the internet. And of course, this is one of the big advantages it has over gold, is that you can send it over the internet, you can store it in your computer, you can store a million pounds worth of it on a thumb drive easily, you can store it by printing it out because it's really just a sort of number it's just a in a way to get access to your part of the bitcoin internet account you just need your password for that bit of the internet account and if you've got that password you can access it if you don't it's almost impossible to access it obviously if you've made a password fairly decent so as long as you've got that password, you've got access to that Bitcoin, that money. And you can put that password, you can write it down, you can put it on a bit of paper and put it in a safe if you want. You can put it in a deposit, bo uh, deposit box. There are now organisations that will store your Bitcoin for you and will guarantee that value they will replace any bitcoins that they lose so they're kind of like a bitcoin bank like an early bitcoin bank um, like the old style banks where they used to keep your gold for and they charge you for it they charge you for this service two percent so this is what i care about bitcoin this is this is freedom from government money basically this is money that you that we that individuals can control I don't need a bank I don't need a bank to store my money I don't need a bank to transfer my money I don't need a government to guarantee the trustworthiness of my bank I don't need a lawyer to guarantee the trustworthiness of my government 
I don't need all these uh, complicated social structures that all have to work and not be corrupted to be able to transact financially with people I want to. I don't need anyone's permission to send this money to anyone in the world. I don't need, um, all, all you need is internet access. Yeah, you need that. And you need a computer. Um, and that's it. Now, a lot of people, like myself at least originally, was were worried that maybe governments would crack down on Bitcoin because it is such a competitor for government money. And obviously, being able to print money is a, is a is an amazing power. You know, just create money from thin air. Who wouldn't want to be able to do that? Um, so a lot of people were expecting governments to be really anti-Bitcoin. What's actually happened is that governments have been fairly pragmatic about Bitcoin, I would think. And I mean, pragmatism is what politics is about, isn't it? It's about the art of the possible. And I think governments have realised that actually cracking down on Bitcoin might be counterproductive because it would show that they might have a weakness they might have a uh, they might be a weapon for ordinary people to get their freedom from the the financial system as it now stands so at the moment I'd say there's an uneasy truce um, between Bitcoin and governments um, and governments seeming to sort of backtrack or, or backpedal in the face of this thing that they really don't particularly understand yet in, in, in a major way and they certainly, uh, they certainly don't know what to do about it and it's moving so quickly you know it went from one dollar per Bitcoin to now, well, it went over a thousand dollars per Bitcoin, i.e., one dollar per micro Bitcoin (MBC). It went above that figure within a couple of years, and this is why people in this is why people in power and people in government were just still, oh, have you heard of this Bitcoin thing? Oh yes, well I've heard of it. I, I believe it's something on computers. Yeah. And then suddenly, boom, it's arrived properly. Yeah. Now you've got hundreds of millions of dollars going into Bitcoin businesses. Um, you've got hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people involved in Bitcoin. Yeah, this is not something that a government can just brush aside anymore. And certainly not one that wants to appear to be a free, democratic government. Whether it really is or not, you know, obviously if it is, it wants to appear to be one. Often if they're not, they still want to appear to be one. And uh, so... And I think one of the things that really might worry somebody who wanted to attack Bitcoin is how do you do it? Because there's no central company that runs it. There's no person you can go to and put in jail or threaten with putting them in jail like with Julian Assange locked up in, in the Ecuadorian embassy in London you can't do that. There's no Julian Assange of Bitcoin. There's no WikiLeaks of Bitcoin where you can cut off their visa payments. You can cut off their Mastercard payments. How are they still getting payments? They were getting payments through Bitcoin still. Yeah. They couldn't stop that. But they could lock him up.
they can they can shut down the servers of WikiLeaks.